welcome our opening keynote, Simon Beswick for the international CEO of Osborne Clark, who is going to take you on a, I think, a lovely journey and a discussion about Osborne Clark. So welcome, Simon. Good morning, everybody. Aren't we privileged to be here at the very first Bristol Technology Showcase. As I look back on my 30-odd uh, year career as a lawyer, I feel I'm very fortunate. First, for most of those 30 years, I've operated from a base and lived in this great city of Bristol. Second, for those 30 years, I've worked for the most fantastic law firm, a law firm called Osborne Clark. And in recent years, I feel even more privileged because in the job I'm doing now, most weeks I get the opportunity to chat to clients and colleagues in different countries, in North America, uh, in Europe, and in Asia. And most of those conversations are really about the mega trends going on, particularly digital transformation, but also in recent years, decarbonization and the impact they're having on our business. So against that background, I want to spend the next 10 to 15 minutes to tell you a little bit about Osborne Clark and particularly its association with Bristol, its association with innovation, and also its association with the various different industrial revolutions from steam to cyber. In doing so, I'm conscious most of you have probably sat there thinking, what's this guy talking about, you know, the legal profession really isn't very fast-paced, it's not very future-focused. Well, I hope over the next 10 to 15 minutes to kind of prove that wrong. I'm also very conscious that whenever I meet somebody new and say I'm a lawyer, I'm often greeted with a lot of ridicule, and I'm often greeted by a lot of jokes. And uh, most recently, I, I kind of introduced myself to a few people over the last couple of weeks, one joke kept coming back, which was Simon. What's the definition of a missed opportunity? Don't know. What's the definition of missed opportunity? It's a coach load of lawyers going off a cliff with two empty spaces and stuff like that all the time. So, to tell you about the Osborne Clark story, it started in 1748 here in Bristol. It was a startup at that time, and it was started by a guy called Jeremiah Osborne. Now, to the great astonishment of my younger colleagues, I can't actually personally remember what the business looked like in 1748, but I suspect it might have looked something like that. 1748 version of a startup. Back in that time, Bristol was a really thriving merchant city. And actually, a lot of the wealth generation came by the power of wind in sails. And although Jeremiah Osborne had probably no idea, in just 12 short years, the landscape in which that law firm operated changed completely and utterly out of kilter by the first Industrial Revolution. Over the next 70 to 80 years, inventions came thick and fast. And although Bristol really wasn't one of those cities that was as industrialized as others and, and benefited uh, from that change as much as other cities, towards the end of that period, it was quite noticeable in the cargo that both left and arrived in Bristol uh, what was happening. By the time uh, the second uh, Industrial Revolution uh, came along, Osborne Clark had been fortunate to act on many, many um, uh, new projects, bringing different ways of, of, of uh, people uh, living and working. And when that industrial revolution came around, and it really was the advent of plentiful energy and personal transformation, we were fortunate to act for some of the motor vehicle manufacturers that, that subsequently uh, came around, the energy suppliers, and the other people uh, who changed the way uh, in, in which uh, we lived and worked. Moving on to the third industrial revolution, our contact with that came about in 1994 
And I can remember that uh, vividly because we were trying to recruit some technology lawyers in London. And we'd been through an inter interview process going through four or five different meetings. At the very last meeting, we'd already decided we were going to recruit these folk. And they'd previously exchange, um, explained they go to California on a regular basis. They meet hardware and software uh, businesses and help them uh, come into Europe. And at the very last meeting, they said, um, Simon, we were, uh, we were in California a couple of weeks ago, and um, everybody, but everybody, was talking about something. They looked at each other, it was a group of four or five, and, and they kind of were trying to remember what it was everybody was talking about, and one of them piped up and said it, it's the internet. So by pure happen chance of kind of recruiting these lawyers, we were the first UK law firm to have ever heard of the internet. We were big into mobile telecoms at the time, so the combination of the both was really transformative for uh, Osborne Clark. And we really reorientated our business towards uh, technologies that are kind of changing uh, the future. I wanted to just take you back and I want to do this for a particular purpose. The first connection Osborne Clark had with innovation, really, we met head on in 1833. At that time, the business was run also by a Jemiah Osborne. Clearly, Jemiah was a very popular name in those days, but he was the grandson of the founder. And in 1833, he rode Isambard Kingdom Brunel, aged 27 at the time, down the River Avon to um, survey the site for the Clifton Suspension Bridge, which goes to prove that even then, lawyers, uh, lawyers knew what client service is. At the same time, Great Western Railway came into being. And Osborne Clark was a key advisor to securing the enabling act of parliament that enabled the railway to operate. Now, I don't know about you, but for the last 30 years of my life, I've gone up and down the track from Bristol to London once, twice a week. But I've always wondered, why does it end at Paddington? Why, why doesn't it go further into the city? Anybody know? The river. The, the, the a uh, story told through the articles, if you read about this, is it's all to do with the competitive rivalry with Liverpool as a port. So apparently, the original plan was to build the line to go to Euston. And Euston was connected by the um, uh, Great Midlands Railway up to Birmingham. The plan was to connect that up to Liverpool. And when Liverpool as a port heard about it, it complained and as it was funding part of the build of the Great uh, Midlands Railway, it objected to linking Bristol up because it felt it would give Bristol a competitive advantage. So that's the story told uh, through the articles. The story handed down to me in Osborne Clark, which uh, I find fascinating, I have no idea which story is, is, is correct, was it, it was just a simple funding error. They miscalculated when uh, raising the funds to build the railway line because apparently there's a reasonably steep gradient going from Paddington to Euston they hadn't costed that in. Well, that's why we all get off at Paddington uh, these days. So um, going to the sort of third uh, industrial revolution, Osmond Clark had recruited these guys in 1994. They came in, they told us about the internet, but they also brought uh, with them uh, a number of um, uh, really key uh, players in that marketplace. And for most of these companies and many companies that follow after them, We've been very fortunate. We've acted from them from the very uh, early days. When we um, first acted for Yahoo, there were about 100 uh, employees. Um, when we first acted for Facebook, they were in a very, very small office in that building on Palo Alto High Street, and there were about eight to 10 of them. And we've been on a, a, a journey with them uh, ever since. Yours truly was very lucky to work in Silicon Valley in the early 2000s, and um, I find it fascinating. It was really educational for me to see the digital 
uh, 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 revolution up close. And a lot has been written about Silicon Valley and why it's such a success. From my kind of first-hand experience of seeing that, to me, there were five factors. It was the access to the cap um, sorry, access to talent, access to capital, an, an unbelievably DNA'd entrepreneurism in everybody. It was the fact that despite what you read in the papers, most of those entrepreneurs are driven by success, not money. And it was the most fantastic collaboration that was going on there. So if you go back to the talent, they're very fortunate to have the Stanford Engineering School uh, on its doorstep, the Stanford Business School, and more recently, the startup program at Stanford, which is unbelievably good. They've also got access to the, to the fantastic talent that's coming out of Caltech. Uh, Caltech is the West Coast equivalent of MIT, and the talent are coming out of, 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 of Berkeley. In terms of access to capital, if any of you have been there and you've been down Sand Hill Road, you will realize just on one road, there is the most enormous amount of capital that can be deployed locally. 35% of global venture funding is into the Bay Area. 35% of global funding. It's phenomenal. In terms of that entrepreneurial attitude and the fact that it's DNA'd, there were a couple of uh, experiences I had in my very early days which uh, made me realize how important it was. Um, first, I was introduced to a surgeon at a drinks party and got speaking, uh, speaking to the guy. And at no point did he say, I'm a surgeon. When I went up and said, what do you do? His response was, I'm developing a medical device. Whether you be a surgeon, a doctor, an accountant, a lawyer, they're not there primarily to be that. They're trying to think of a business. They're trying to build innovation, build the future. Also, before I went out to California, I was doing a lot of uh, venture capital investment work for the investors and also for the companies uh, raising capital. When I was acting for the companies, I would spend a lot of the time just explaining how the industry works, explaining what the suite of documents might look like, explaining what the provisions in those documents might contain. My first encounter with a company raising capital when I was in Silicon Valley was they came in and they said, Simon, all we want to know from you is what are the multiples being used on liquidation preference clauses in the last month? And it was that specific. They got the rest of the knowledge. It, it, it was built in there. I talked about success and, and, and being motivated by success, not money. Very much the belief is you're not an entrepreneur unless you've been successful three times. Three times. At another drinks party, I'd heard about a French entrepreneur that lived reasonably close to me who just sold his latest business for 300 million dollars. That was on a Friday night. On the Saturday morning, I was walking to the center of Palo Alto to get a coffee and a bagel. On my way back, I passed him and said, um, Alan, fantastic. I've heard you've just sold this business. Uh, congratulations. And being very much in a British mindset, so I've acted for lots of people who've made a great success, made a fortune themselves. And generally speaking, it doesn't always happen, but generally speaking, the average British response to that is we retire, whether we're 26, 36, 46, 66, or we go on a long holiday and we think about what we're going to do. So I responded to this guy and said, Alan, fantastic. Um, I, I assume you're going to take a big break now and you're going to go on a holiday. Where are you going to go traveling? And he just looked at me as though I was a complete and utter moron and said, Simon, come with me. Walk me down the road, walk me up his driveway, open the garage. This is the next morning. It was about 9 o'clock next morning. And in the garage were four software engineers hard at work on their computer. This was the next day after selling a business for 300 million. Phenomenal. And collaboration. There's a great Silicon Valley story about Hewlett Packard. 
Uh, in the very early days of Hewlett-Packard, they lost five really key engineers who went on to various different businesses that ultimately became Intel. These en engineers were trying to design a transistor. Uh, they would got a long way down the road, but hit a design problem. And they worked on it for weeks upon weeks upon weeks and couldn't break through. And they thought about it and thought about how are we going to uh, how are we going to take this to the next stage? And one of them said, there is only one person we know, and I can't remember if it's Mr. Hullard or Mr. Uh, Packard, but it was one of them. Why don't we give, it, give him a call? Now, these are five people who've left their business, set up a, a competing business. In response, Hewlett Packard closed their business a week later, took their main engineers, went down, worked with these guys, sorted out the issue, and went back and carried on as Hewlett Packard. And they were given stock options as a result of that. And that there's a whole sort of generation of why stock options uh, has, has taken place. One of the things I also learned when I was there is the art of timing and the fact that valuations go significantly up and significantly down. If you take one of our clients, Yahoo, at the peak of the market, it was worth 125 billion. It was sold a few years ago now for a fraction of that price. And the bit you might not remember on their journey was they got very, very close to buying Google for a billion, and they tried really, really hard to buy Facebook for a billion but the art of timing and valuation. Today, those prime valuations, as far as we can see, are very, very much reserved for AI companies. One of our clients in the Valley, um, a few weeks ago, did a Series A funding round, and the average Series A funding round in the UK is about five million pounds. They did a Series A funding round that raised 500 million. It's a valuation of 7 billion. So that's the really, really hot space. I was back in Silicon Valley a few months ago, went round to all the people I used to know at the time whose children are just leaving university now and would say, uh, what's uh, Johnny doing or what's Jane doing? And the response from everybody was, they're an AI software engineer. That's today's uh, gold mine. So um, here we are in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution, the cyber revolution, industrial revolution 4.0, as you please. But if you think about the previous ones, they were really all about humans coming together with technology to produce greater efficiency. What we're seeing at the moment is very different. We're actually witnessing the coming together of the physical and the technical. It's very, very different. And on the slide uh, that, that is being shown at the moment, I've just put up there some of the technologies which are going to transform our lives as we move forward. Because of our success, with the digital revolution and acting for a number of those platforms, we've got access to acting for a lot of leading businesses in these uh, different technologies. And we're doing some unbelievable uh, legal work. If you just take the AI space as one example of that, some of the work we're doing is for social media uh, providers where they're using AI to identify inappropriate content and to take down that content. We're also using, uh, sorry, acting for companies using AI to develop programmable chips and software that can gather the data that's necessary for those fleets of semi-autonomous vehicles driving around Silicon Valley. And actually, when I was there a couple of months ago, I pulled up to a set of traffic lights, and this vehicle very slowly pulled up next to me with all these sensors on top. Very weird uh, uh, sensation. And most interestingly, we're acting for a group of companies that have set up a digital 
workforce. This is a workforce of software bots. And one of those clients just recently has put a system into a bank that has fully automated the mortgage application process from the customer going online to making the decision all through software bots. So when you look back and you think of the various different industrial revolutions, I know they're all different, but actually there are some common features of all of them. First and foremost, they very much need the entrepreneur, the entrepreneurial spirit that's going to take an idea and make it become reality. You need that access to talent. And wow, haven't we got that talent here in Bristol? We've got some fantastic universities producing great talent, and we've got a city that's attracting great talent. We need access to the capital. You also need access to advice to protect those ideas and also to make sure that the innovation uh, delivers the profits and gains as you would expect it to do. And today, more importantly than at any other time in our history, we've got to be sure that that innovation is not going to harm humanity. So on that note, I'm being very conscious of the fact that this talk's going to be followed by a panel discussion on AI. I just wanted to leave you with some thoughts of the former chess champion, uh, Gary uh, Kasparov, who today, I don't know if you know this, but today he plays chess against computers with the aid of a computer. He doesn't play them on his own uh, anymore. So on that note, thank you very much uh, for listening to me. <laughs>